Good morning. Glad to be with you this morning. Thank you for calling me famous. I wasn't aware of that, Cosman. <laughs> but I'm glad to be here, and we're going to cut right to the chase because they're limiting in our, t our time, aren't they? Many people today are worried about what's happening in the world with things such as terrorism. Not only that, we have climate change ticking in the background. Then, of course, there is this global child sexual abuse. And finally, of course, we have a fragile global economy. And people are wondering, what does the future hold? What's going to happen next? You may remember the year 2012. I'm sure you remember that. Remember, many people, the world was going to come to an end, and lots of predictions were made around the Mayan calendar. But what actually happened? Well, nothing happened. Now, I'm not knocking the people who are making predictions. I'm just saying it's not easy to predict the future. What about the year 2000? Remember all the predictions that were made around then? Y2K bug and so on, but what happened? Well, again, nothing happened. It's not easy to predict the future, which I guess leads to another question. Can we actually know what the future holds? Can we actually tell what is going to happen in the future. Let me tell you that if you wanted to know or have a source that says where I can tell the future, you would need two things of that source, two essential ingredients. Number one, you would want historical accuracy. If that source can't even get the facts right from today or in the past, can you trust it about the future? Does it get its facts straight? That's the first thing. Secondly, you would want a source with a proven track record of dependable predictions, meaning when it makes predictions, they actually happen again and again and again. You don't want a batting average of 16% or 60%. You want a batting average of 100. Is there such a source? Yes, indeed there is, and we're going to share with you the evidence for that source uh, as we begin this session. The evidence is going to come from university history. It's been my privilege to study at uh, that uh, at university history level, both archaeology and, uh, and uh, university history. We're going to begin at the Dead Sea in Israel. Here on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea, back in 1947, at a place called Qumran, a young Bedouin boy by the name of Muhammad Adib was minding the clan's goats when one of the goats strayed up into some cliffs. Uh, they threw a stone to get the goat back and they heard the sound of breaking pots. When they went into the caves hoping there'd be treasure, all they found was some old pots and inside some very old scrolls. Now, they took these scrolls to their Bedouin clan who then took them to Bethlehem in Israel and sold them to an antiquities dealer by the name of Kando. He bought them for 50 US dollars and uh, 100 US dollars, sorry. And uh, a few years later, those scrolls were selling for 500,000 US dollars. That's inflation in anybody's terms, isn't it? How come these scrolls today are pretty much invaluable? You couldn't put a price on them pretty much. They're called, of course, the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. They're famous for a number of reasons, and valuable, I should say, as well. One, they're very old, and anything old seems to be worth money to us today. So that's the first reason. How old are they? Well, we know from radiocarbon dating and the style of the script, because script styles change through time, and also from coins that were found with some of these scrolls that they date back to 100 to 200 BC, so 2,200 years old, some of these scrolls. Now, these scrolls, some of them contain ancient predictions with a very proven track record, which we're going to share some of them today from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, what were these scrolls? Well, they contained the rules of the commune that copied them, the group of Jewish monastics. Probably, we believe they were the Essenes. They contained some of their beliefs as well. But the biggest proportion of them, about 40% of them, were every book of the ancient Old Testament, what we call the Bible, the Old Testament part. If you've ever been to a motel, you've probably seen a Bible, may have one at home, and 40% came from this and every part, parts of every part of the Old Testament except the book of Esther was found among that collection. These were copies, of course, of the Old Testament scriptures. Now, what we want to do now is say, well, the biblical writings that these 
this was what the 40 percent were how do they stack up with historical accuracy and with dependable track record of fulfilled predictions does do these scrolls stack up and what we call our bibles today all right let's go and have a look at the historical accuracy and the prophetic reliability we give you the evidence now from the uh from archaeology so let's begin the prophet isaiah in the dead sea scrolls they found almost two complete scrolls about nine meters long that's a long scroll isn't it and uh, the prophet isaiah made some amazing predictions and uh, about the city of babylon so we're going to have a look at what he had to say by the way the isaiah scrolls date back originally the original when he wrote them about 700 bc these were copies that dated back to 2100 or 2200 years ago now he made predictions concerning babylon and israel in his writings way back 700 bc first of all he said the babylonians would destroy jerusalem and take captives to babylon the babylonians were a great civilization in what we call mesopotamia today iraq is where they were in our in our geography today so that's the first prediction let's put it up and let's see what the archaeologists have found so 700 bc he writes behold the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated unto this day shall be carried to babylon nothing shall be left says the lord now he wrote that 700 bc the babylonians under nebuchadnezzar a very famous king of babylon took made three raids against the city of jerusalem 100 years after he wrote those predictions 605 597 and 586 bc that's what the biblical writers show us but we actually now have discovered a tablet which you can see in the british museum it's known as the nebuchadnezzar's babylonian chronicle it talks about his second raid in 597 bc we have a replica on display there that you need to have a look at during one of the breaks this afternoon so what the prophet isaiah wrote was actually factual we have archaeological evidence one of the kings that he took captive during those three raids was a guy called king jehoiachin he's mentioned in the biblical writings uh, many times and uh, he was one of the captives now it mentions his uh, one of the places in the biblical records nebuchadnezzar took jehoiachin captive to babylon and then it mentions the rations that this guy was given meaning the amount of food the babylonians gave this fellow to eat while he was in their captivity notice what it says as for his jehoiachin's provisions the there was a regular ration given him by the king of babylon a portion for each day until the day of his death all the days of his life so pavlova on monday tuesday kentucky fried and so on is all written down <laughs> that was his ration well what's amazing is if you go to the Ber the to berlin today in germany you will see jehoiachin's ration tablet in the pergamon museum they've actually discovered the archaeological evidence that that was an actually a true account of what took place this king is mentioned by the babylonians in their tablets their clay tablets so historical accuracy we're going to see that again and again so number one babylon to destroy jerusalem and take captives to babylon we can see that very clearly number two he, it explains how Cyrus, he predicted how Cyrus would capture Babylon 150 years before this actually happened. So let's notice the prediction. Before we go to the prediction, however, the biblical prophet Daniel, and his was also found in the Dead Sea Scroll. In fact, it was a favorite of the Essenes. In Daniel's book, a whole book called Daniel, he mentions that Nebuchadnezzar was the builder of what we call the Neo Babylonian or the New Babylon, because it had been destroyed by the Assyrians some years before. And uh, uh, the founder was supposed to be Nebuchadnezzar, according to the Bible, in Daniel's fourth chapter. Well, the scholars said that's rubbish, that's nonsense, that's not true, that's a myth, that's a blunder. We know it was a queen called Semiramis, they said, about 700, 800 BC. 
Well, when the archaeologists got excavating, they discovered that the biblical writings were true. On the Ishtar gates, which led into the city of Babylon, you can see them in the Pergamon Museum today. The Germans excavated, took them down and reassembled them there. On the side of the gates, you see an inscription which says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, laid the foundation of the gates. Not only that, in the same museum and in other museums, you can see these bricks which have Nebuchadnezzar's name on them. Scholars now recognize the Bible was right and they were wrong originally. So historical accuracy again. Now Nebuchadnezzar, when he built the city or rebuilt it, embellished it, he actually had the part of the river Euphrates, which was the great river of the Babylonians, run through the middle of the city. So some of the city on either side. You will notice here um, he has these, uh, the, there's the Euphrates River, then there are the walls, and then there are these what we call the river gates. So you could get along the river, but you still were not inside the city because of the walls and the gates. It was considered a city that could not be taken. Let's go back to Isaiah now because he's the one that made the predictions about the fall of Babylon. He said Babylon's gates would be left open to Cyrus. He has about four or five chapters in the book of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scroll collection uh, as well, which show this. He says, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. This guy hasn't even yet been born at this time, way off whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. And he's talking about Babylon in this context. So the gates would be left open. Not only that, Cyrus was to dry up Babylon's river, Euphrates River. It says, who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure. Cyrus is going to do it. That's what Isaiah is saying here. All right, let's go back to Babylon now. What happened with Babylon? How was this city captured? If we can have that back again, thanks, gentlemen. Not sure where we've gone to. Okay, here we come. How was Babylon taken and captured? The fateful night for the Babylonians was October 13, 539 BC. The Medo-Persian army had had a big fight with the Babylonians. The Medo-Persian army was under Cyrus, the king of Persia. They had had a big fight. The Persians had won. The Medo-Persians, the Babylonians, I should say, withdrew into their city and the Medo-Persians under Cyrus besieged it, hoping to conquer it. Well, inside the city, mentioned also by Daniel, there was a great feast going on. It's famously known as Belshazzar's Feast, but it's also mentioned by ancient historians, Greek historians. There was a feast, a festival going on, and Daniel also records it. Uh, while the feast was going on, uh, uh, Cyrus, the great Persian leader, had his workmen do some tinkering with the Euphrates River, that part that flowed into the city. He had them dig some channels off from the river outside that lowered the river as it flowed through the city of Babylon, lowered it enough so the soldiers could walk along the sort of muddy river bank, river bed, or that part of the, the, the river that flowed through. And so they were able to get into the city, into the, beside the city, I should say, but the gates, remember? Those gates. But that night, Babylon's gates were left open. Evidently, the soldiers were participating in the festival. They were drunk. They left the gates open, and the Medo-Persians just poured into the city and took Babylon uh, captive to them. And so the Medo-Persians under Cyrus took over. This is backed up, not just by what the Bible says, but Greek historians like Xenophon and Herodotus. Now, so how Cyrus was to capture Babylon, it happened exactly as was predicted. Not only that, Isaiah predicted, let's go back here, back one, Cyrus would set the Israelites free because they had been taken captive as we saw like Jehoiachin and others and he would free the captives and let the Jews go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city. Here's his prediction. I have raised him, that Cyrus, up in righteousness, he shall build my city and let my exiles go free. 
This is 700 BC, 150 years before. So Cyrus is to free Israel and rebuild Jerusalem. Fourth thing is going to happen is Cyrus is going to restore the temple of Jerusalem. The Babylonians had destroyed Jerusalem's temple that was built by Solomon the great king some years before, around about 950 BC, and Cyrus was going to restore the temple was the prediction. Here it is. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. There's the prediction. The temple would be rebuilt. Now, did it all happen? Yes, there's a very famous cylinder. Uh, we have a replica on display out there called the Cyrus Cylinder. Cyrus, when he captured the city of Babylon, he records that he took the city, but he also records how he allowed the people to go back to their homeland and he gave, allowed them to rebuild their temples. In fact, according to the biblical records, he gave the Jews money or, or goods to build their temple as well so the cyrus cylinder is a very famous cylinder it's in the british museum today because it's historical uh, evidence that what the bible writers not only wrote about the events but the predictions that they made were actually quite accurate indeed so this book is has prophetic reliability when it comes to its predictions now in the bible that you may have in your home there are 800 prophetic verses. 90% of those predictions have already been fulfilled in ancient civilizations. We could spend the rest of the day showing you predictions about Egypt, uh, ancient Egypt, about the Assyrians and so on, but we don't have time for that. They've already been fulfilled and archeological support is there for many of those predictions. So there's only 10%. They're the ones in process or yet just in the future to be fulfilled. And these are the ones we're going to press on through the rest of the day to talk about those predictions. These are found concerning our own time, this 10%, and they're especially found in the books of Daniel, which was found among the Dead Sea Scroll collection, one of the favourite books of those Jewish monastics, and the book of Revelation, the last book in the biblical records. These contain the 10%. And we're going to unpack these as we go today, some of them. We can't go through everything, but we're going to start to unpack these predictions which deal with our own time and some of the history that has just been in the past that leads up to our day. So, what are we seeing here? The biblical prophecies that we're going to look at have good, solid, scientific, meaning archaeological evidence. Not fairy tales, not myths, not legends. There's some substance there. On display, when you have a break, I will show you a number of other artifacts that we don't have time to talk about that show the historical accuracy as well. Uh, so if you want to have, come out to the table there under ancient mysteries, and I will explain some of those artifacts that have been found. I'll also share with you some of the old pottery. There's some pots out there that are very old, go, date back to around about two, 4,000 years old. So if you want to have a feel of some old pots, they're the real ones. We do have a lot of artifacts as well, copies. But have a look at that stuff, and I'll explain some of it during the breaks uh, if you have some questions on some of that.